Welcome to the AAK Podcast, brought to you by All About Kids, the leading provider of children's therapeutic and educational services in New York. This podcast will dive deep into discussions on children's developmental needs and the stories of parents and other adults who have dealt with developmental disorders. Each conversation on this show is an extension of our mission to create a world where all children have access to intervention, allowing them to live a full and rich life without restriction, where parents have access to the information and training they need to support their child's therapy and special education needs, and where disabilities, therapy, and special education can be openly discussed without stigma. This time, I sit down with Jennifer Cody, an occupational therapist with over a decade of experience and the OT and PT supervisor at All About Kids. This episode is the second of a two-part series on sensory diets. In this episode, Jen walks me through how to implement sensory diets in an increasingly digital world, what to do if you are in need of a sensory diet without access to an OT, the different senses and how they're integrated into the diet, will my child outgrow her sensory issues, and more. If you'd like to reach out with a question, comment, or anything else related to the podcast, you can send us an email at hello at aakcares.com. That's hello at aakcares.com. Without further ado, please enjoy this deep dive on sensory diets, part two, with All About Kids' own Jen Cody. What's up, everyone? Thank you for joining us on the All About Kids podcast, and this is Sensory Diets Round Two. And if you listen to the first episode on sensory diets, which I highly recommend, you can go back and check that out. We teased a few things towards the end of that episode that we're going to go through in detail here. And the first thing that we teased is sensory diets and how they interact with the digital world. Because as you know, and as Jen knows, of course, we are in the throes of a, a digital revolution that started 10, 20 years ago. And there's so many things like tablets, iPhones, TVs, technology all around us. You literally can't escape it. And so to start this off, Jen, is there something interesting about the interaction between sensory diets and the the digital world that could provide a foundation for this part of the discussion Some, something about the development of the digital world alongside sensory diets that's really caught your attention in the past few years so technology is obviously a very big topic for all different fields at this point right and it could be a really sensitive one especially for parents actually, parents and non-parents, and everybody's always judging somebody about the use of tech technology with their children, and to lay an extra huge layer of pressure on top of everyone is this past year. We've had to rely on technology even more so with our children, whether we like it or not. So to answer your question about how it relates to sensory systems and sensory diets in general, it's kind of one of those things where it's a necessary evil. We we have to use technology in our daily lives. And honestly, thank God in a lot of ways. We, you know, it's helping us. It's helping kids in a lot of great ways. A lot of children that might have communication issues are using technology to communicate in ways that we've never seen before. So, you know, it's fantastic for, for that. There's a lot of ways that we can use technology to help soothe the child, to help them learn to cope. There's things that a child can access on a technological device where they can help themselves, right? Making a schedule, a timer, all sorts of things. So I don't want to discount the fantastic things that technology can do. But if, if I'm talking about strictly sensory concerns and sensory issues that parents are dealing with, you know, one of the biggest things is exposure to different kinds of sensory input. So if you're just relying on a, on a device, you're not going to be getting the same kind of input, the same different kinds of input that you can get in the real world. So at the end of the day, I'm not going to say that technology should never be a part of a sensory diet because there's there's a place for it. There are great things that technology can do and can help a therapist and can help a family and can help a child. But I think it's one of those things that we have to think about in moderation. And especially this year, though, I mean, parents, give yourself a break. We're, we're all just trying to get through, um, you know, and, and even ourselves as adults, you know, I'm, I've used 
devices and TVs and all sorts of things way more this year because we really didn't have a choice when you were by yourself, you know? So give yourself a break and just know, you know, you know your child best, right? You know what, what how much is going to be too much. It's tricky. It's a, tr- it's a tricky thing because there are so many studies going on, you know, about the detriments to technology, right? Like the the blue light effects on children, all that kind of stuff. And I don't want to say that I'm, I I don't know all the ins and out of that. So I don't want to speak to that, but you know, it's one of those things, moderation, too much is not going to be good, but not using it at all is just silly and really ridiculous because you can't avoid technology at this point. Yeah. It seems, it seems like such an, such a difficult battle, especially for therapists in particular, because you have, the reality that the kid is in throughout the day and that has certain stimulations, whether it's feel, taste, touch, and then you also have the the digital reality, which is another reality on its own, which can provide visual sensations. But now in a world of virtual reality, there are so many things that are entering into the realm of what's going to be possible to communicate sensorily. I hope that's a word. And, <laughs> but yeah, all, all the senses, it, it seems like we're moving towards a world where it will be an option where virtual reality can encompass a lot of what you're experiencing throughout the day beyond just seeing it. It'll incorporate, you'll have like these touch fests and things that vibrate and things you can smell or maybe even taste. So I imagine that's going to be such a big part of a a therapist's regimen. It, and it, it already is a big part, but even more so as virtual reality continues to get closer and closer to the reality that we're in every day. It's like, how do I know what's good and what's bad? Where does one end? Where does one begin? Yeah, and and I have to say there's some there is some really cool stuff like you like exactly like you're saying there is some really cool, you know, beneficial things that are coming out, you know, based in technology and, you know, I'm here for it. I can't wait to see and I can't wait to try out all these things. But then the flip side to that is, you know, while technology is you know, a vital and necessary part of all of our lives. You also have to think about the access to those kind of devices. Not every family that we work with or every child is going to have the same access to the newest, latest technology. So that's also something to think about as well. So again, we can't rely on it, but we can't discount it either. Are there any guidelines that could apply broadly for the amount of time that kids are spending on their screens because I I can completely understand a parent wanting to leave their kid an iPad and that gives the kid and the parent the freedom of time. The the parent can then do what they want to do and then their kid can also use the technology as a tool without taking up the time of the the parent or a therapist. Is, Is there a point where you would say that you should maybe think about switching your kid off of the technology or some signs that there's overuse where the the screen time has gone too far and you kind of need to bring it back a little bit. Yeah, I think um, a big indicator is how they're reacting when you do try to take it away. If that's becoming a struggle, then that to me points to that's too much time. You know what I mean? And it's going to be different for every single child. And and I'm sure that doctors and psychologists have maybe started to look at like an actual amount of time. But I think you really just have to look at your own child and see where the problem lies. You know, if you notice they're having trouble sleeping, if you notice when you try to take it away, it's it's a meltdown and a fight. Then to me, those are telltale signs like, OK, maybe he needs a break from technology. And you also have to consider what you're using the technology for. So his or her screen time, does that include the education piece? You know, are they doing online learning? So should that count towards their screen time? Should it not? Um, are they doing educational games? Are they getting some sort of sensory input? Or are they just mindlessly you know, scrolling or watching videos. So I think that's also something to consider too, what, what they're using the devices for. Yeah. And, and there's so much, it seems like there's so much, at least right now from reality, reality that 
you get uh, there, there's a physical physical inputs and physical feedback that you can't get yet from virtual reality, like throwing a ball, for example. I, I've I grew up throwing a ball, pushing my brothers around, doing a lot of physical activities, and that gave me the depth perception and kind of the feel of how to play around. And I've definitely had catches with younger kids whether it's for like a baseball camp or something and I'm I'm like five feet away and they're just like repeatedly launching the ball as hard as they can at me and it there's definitely is like a phase of learning your body and learning how to interact with the physical world but there's also like sometimes I wonder like does this kid know like does he have any idea of how hard to throw a ball to get it to this point has he played outside because I remember that comes pretty quickly when you're a kid like you learn you know okay this is the right speed to throw it yeah and so like that at least right now you can't really get that it seems like from virtual reality or screen games right there's some things they haven't replicated yet (laughs) yes yeah luckily we'll see maybe uh we're in uh some sort of reality simulation right now so who knows (laughs) um (laughs) So in in terms of how to devise a, a sensory diet, of course, the best option would be with an OT, with an occupational therapist and, and someone that's developed the skills to recommend certain exercises that apply to whatever the kid needs to develop for families that may not have access to an occupational therapist, whether it's geographical or financial, there's there's some barrier to getting services, maybe they're on a wait list or something like that. There's not many therapists in the area. Is there anything that you tell parents that may not have access to an OT about creating a sensory diet? Any any resources? Obviously you can't replicate an occupational therapist expertise but is there anything that you can do in the meantime while you're waiting or while you're in a position where you don't have consistent access to an OT? Yeah so one of the reasons an OT is really great at this kind of stuff is we are specifically and specially trained in task analysis so we want to take a step back and we as OTs look at the whole picture and then we break it down into a thousand parts And we really want to narrow down where the breakdown is happening, where the challenge, which part is providing the concern or the issue. And that's where we start. So again, like you mentioned, the best thing would be to have an OT, right? Or someone else that is trained in that. But absence of that, I encourage parents to kind of do that as best they can. Take a look. And sometimes it may, may require you tracking it for a couple of weeks, like take a piece of paper and keep it you know, on your fridge and just see if you can find any kind of pattern or even not a pattern, any kind of triggers or anything that is you know, making your child have a difficult time. Just write it down. Is it always in the morning? Is it always, you know, when it's nap time? Is it always, you know, during meal times? Like, you know, what is it? Can you find anything and go from there? Because then maybe you can identify a specific sense or a specific, you know, routine that is troubling. So keep some sort of, some sort of daily journal where you're writing down the connection between behavior and habits and seeing if anything pops up consistently. Yes. And then, you know, to follow that through, if you do think you, you know, oh, you know what? I I really think I'm trying to think in the last episode, I think we spoke about like oral motor Mm -hmm. concerns. um, Yeah. Chewing sensitivity. Just to continue. Yeah. To continue on that thread, you know, maybe that's what you discovered. You know, he always has trouble at mealtimes. Like he doesn't ever want to come to the table. Okay. Well, maybe he's avoiding something that has to do with food. So now let's say you did a little research and you're like, I'm going to try and give him crunchy foods. Okay. So now you want to keep that log going as you introduce new sensory input or new ways or, you know, strategies that you might try and see if you think they're working or not working or make things worse or make things better or have no change at all. Like, you know, so you want to make sure you're seeing because just similar to um, allergies in kids, you don't you don't introduce 10 foods at once. Right. Because then you won't know which one they're allergic to. You want to do the same thing with sensory input. You don't want to try 10 different things at once 
because then you don't know which one's working, which one's making it worse. So, you know, kind of ease into it. And then the, the easiest, simplest thing, um, and this goes for all kids, whether or not you think they have sensory processing concerns or not, exposure. You know, don't just do one thing because that's what you're used to and that's what your child likes. You know, um, expose them to as many different sensory stimuli as you can. So, you know, playing music, playing outside on grass, playing outside on sand, playing outside on snow, touching paint, touching cardboard, touching, you know, different, the more exposure you can have for your child, the more beneficial it's going to be, you know, for everything. The child, the child's job, a child's job is to play right? So we want to give them as many opportunities to play with different things to just expose them. Yeah. That's why I was able to retire at 13 years old because I made so much from my job of playing that I, <laughs> I had it saved up. So I put it all in the, the piggy bank. That's a great point to, to work with the child to use what they may enjoy doing already like you mentioned playing outside or playing on grass or listening to music and and fit that in with what you think and what what the ot think because the occupational therapist is only there for a few hours a week something like that and so Mm -hmm. even if you were able to get an ot to come in and see your child it would be great to I'm sure for you, if a parent handed you this habits journal, it's like, hey, I tracked my kid for two months. This is everything he responds to. This is what he doesn't respond to. I'm sure that saves a lot of trial and error on your part of being able to tailor a a sensory diet plan for the kid. Yeah. And to be honest, that's probably one of the first things that I'm going to ask a parent when, when I when I start with a new child and um, their sensory concerns. I'm going to ask all those questions anyway. So <laughs> it's great if they have it already done and ready to go. Yeah. And, and one of the, the things you have as well is the hundreds or thousands of kids that you've seen and the experience of what works and what doesn't. So if a parent's trying to do it on their own, if they have no other option, of course, it's good to try to do some things and figure it out bef- uh, while you're waiting for services or, or you can't get services for some reason. But then if, if you have an OT that comes in with thousands of hours of experience, they may be able to manage expectations a little bit better. Whereas, you know, you're like, oh, I don't know if my kid's going to, you know, survive for the next two weeks because he keeps uh, like trying to eat his shirts and the OT can be like, all right, like this is, you know, this has happened before. I've seen this before. And this is kind of what you can expect for your situation. Exactly. It's nice. Uh, you know, as oh, as therapists, we have our uh, bag of tricks and uh, it's not just a physical bag of tricks. It's also the, the mental toolbox that we have. And exactly like you said, it's based on all of our experiences and things that have worked and ideas that we've been forced to come up with because certain things didn't work. So exactly. It's nice to have, um, you know, to weed some things out right at the start to try and get this child to be where they need to be. I was, I was thinking about this as we were preparing for the episode. There's a lot of medications that kids can get on when they're younger, and it may or may not have a, a beneficial effect for the the child later in life. And, and I'm not a, a doctor at all. I was just wondering if the sensory diets in your experience have created an environment for a kid where they may have been able to get off certain medications after a period of time or what the parent thought was a problem that needed to be medicated was actually more of just a sensory energy experience thing with a with a proper sensory diet routine have there been any interesting insights you've had with the the crossover between prescriptions and uh sensory diets so personally, I haven't had what, what you were just describing, but similarly, a lot of times medications that children might have to be on for various reasons, they might have side effects that are showing up in various sensory differences or sensory struggles or sensory sensitivities. And that is something that 
you know, getting to the root of that concern is sometimes as simple as adjusting their medication or adjusting the time that they take their medication um, or things like that. Obviously, that is not, you know, as occupational therapists, we are also not doctors and we would never advise a patient or a family to alter their medications in any way without first discussing it with their doctor. But that being said, definitely, you know, saying, hey, I see X, Y, Z. And then the mom turns out, she's like, oh, you know what? We just started him on a new medication. I wonder if that's it. And then it turns out they talk to the doctor and the doctor's like, oh yeah, you know what? I've heard that the kids can be really sensitive to the heat or something. And now we're noticing that the child's avoiding playing outside because he's getting overheated so quickly. Okay, well that we're, now we know that that was caused by the medication. So now what can we do about it? So yeah, medications for sure can play a part in a child's sensory processing overall. So this would be, let, let's switch gears a little bit and get into the, the different senses. We got into the, the introduction of, of senses overall in the last episode. What are the different senses and how are they integrated into the, the sensory diet? Sure. So that's a great question and something maybe we should have addressed first, but <laughs> we, we, we want to make sure they're um, so loyal everybody... listeners to the podcast. So you got to go, got to yeah. come in round two. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So everybody knows the typical five senses that you learn when you're a kid, right? Um, hearing, sight, taste, smell, and touch, right? Everybody knows those. Those are the ones we learn. Those are the, probably the ones that come to mind when you start talking about the senses, right? Those common five senses are mostly affected by external stimuli that's detected by your, by those sensory organs. So, you know what I mean? You know, you see something, you know, and, and that's affecting your internal. So there's other sensory systems that are at work within our bodies, so they're internal stimuli that we're having to process. And these sensory systems are maybe not as well known, but they are the huge ones for OTs a lot of the time. So I'll take, we, we could take a quick look at those. One is the somatosensory system. And that includes some of the ones we already spoke about. That that's, um, looks at your touch receptors, your pain tolerance, pain receptors, temperature, and proprioception. Proprioception is a big, big, big one for me um, with a lot of the kids I work with. And some people know what proprioception is. Some people think they know what proprioception is. Um, so I can try and break that down a little bit right now. So essentially, proprioception is knowing where your, your own body is in space. You know, it's the perception or the awareness of your body position, of your body moving. It's a, a really important part of being able to regulate yourself, to coordinate your movements, your postural movements, and your overall body awareness. So for example, if you close your eyes and I ask you to touch your nose, you can touch your nose, right? You know where your nose is without having to see it, right? Internally, you know where your nose is. Or for example, if, if, I, told, if, if I said, copy me, and I raise my arm up like this, you could look at me and look at your, and look at my arm and you can make your own arm do that. Okay. So, so that's what I mean with proprioception and it's kind of grading your movement. So ha having a well. clear sense of where your body is moving through space, whether your eyes are closed, eyes are open, you have that feel of where you're at. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So another sensory system that we deal a lot with is the vestibular system. Again, it's kind of one of those things where you're like, oh yeah, I've heard of that, but I'm not entirely sure what, what it does and why, why it's important. So I'm not going to break down what the internal pieces of it is, but, but essentially it has to do with how your body moves in different planes. And a lot of it is your inner ears. So sometimes this is, that's a lot of what people know about is um, maybe vertigo or things like that when they have a, you know, a specific concern or specific issue. But basically it's, the movement, gravity, or balance sense. So it's, it's your internal balance, keeping yourself upright and being able to move smoothly. Um, a lot of times I think about this, you know, as an adult, we tend, you know, we're, we're a little bit more stationary than kids on a, on a daily basis, right? We're sitting and we sit at our desks and that's pretty much it. 
we lay down to go to bed at night. So now I'm turned my head and now I'm in a different plane. That's pretty much about it. You know, if you work out, if you do active things, then yes, you're moving more, you know, moving around in different planes more frequently. But now think about a kid. A child is playing on the floor. They're laying on their bellies to read. They're jumping up and down. They're swinging on a playground. So now think about how their body is moving in all these different ways. They're spinning around in circles because every kid loves to do that. <laughs> they're, you know, they're upside down. When they think if they do sports, they're in gymnastics, they're flipping around, they're doing all sorts of things. So their bodies are moving way more frequently in different planes. So those are two systems. And, and just to give an idea of where I would see a concern or an issue with those two systems is exactly what you were mentioning before about being able to throw a ball. You know, maybe that force needed, they're doing it too hard or not hard enough. Maybe this is the child who wants to hug his friend, but he's tackling his friend to the ground because he can't grade that pressure. He doesn't know. He thinks he's just giving him a hug because he can't feel that feedback, you know, so so that kind of thing. Vestibular. So maybe this is the child that is spinning around in circles constantly because he's trying to get that input because his body's not processing it the same. Whereas one child could spin three times and they're like, okay, that was fun, but I'm good. I'm going to get dizzy. This child is spinning 300 times and now he's knocking into all of his friends and banging into the wall because his body doesn't feel that same movement the same way the other child do, does. So those are two big ones. Then there's one more one that is a little bit harder to um, explain and a little bit harder to grasp. Sometimes even I struggle with it. Um, and there's just been recently a lot more information and a lot more understanding coming out about this one, but it's interoception. So this is the awareness or perception of sensations from inside the body. And what I mean by that is, is, you know, you're receiving, assessing and understanding internal bodily signals. So, you know, feeling your heartbeat and feeling it beat faster or slower, um, knowing when you need to take a deep breath as opposed to just regular breaths, um, knowing if you're hungry, knowing if you're full. Um, if you're thirsty, those kind of things. A big one when I think about this is, um, for children at least, is potty training. Um, that sensation of having to go to the bathroom, the sensation of having already went to the bathroom. You know, this this is the this is the system, and these are the senses that we, we that are being tapped into for all of those things. And they are also discovering that a lot of these interoception has to do with emotions and deciphering and understanding internal emotions. So you know, so that's another sense, another sensory system at play that a lot of people don't know about or don't think about. So in, interoception and emotion, you said there's evidence that they may be intertwined so it's not just feeling what the, feeling the sensations that are going on inside your body like breathing or your heartbeat but also being aware of your emotional state yeah pretty much and also sometimes knowing that um you know there is a physical reaction to some emotions right you know and and deciphering that as well yeah i I've, i would be interested to see the the connection between interoception and anxiety because from what you're describing I feel like during periods where maybe I'm feeling more anxious that day I become more hyper aware of my breathing for example or my heartbeat or just like the way my body feels I'm like why am I so aware of these things right now that normally are in the background I don't I don't think about them and that awareness kind of makes me more anxious and it's kind of like this cycle of like why is why can't why can't why am I like so focused <laughs> right, on my breathing yeah so going. I, I would be interested to and and, and that's yeah. that's fascinating to hear about all three of those those systems and, and how they control different parts of the body and and it's not just your it, it's not just a question of are these systems working correctly but is your perception of these systems also in line because your limbs or your breathing or your 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 heartbeat they, those could all be fine if if you test it 
with instruments and you say, oh, your heart beats fine or, you know, your limbs, your ligaments are strong. But then there's the whole added element of, okay, how are you able to move through space? How are you able to feel this? How is it affecting your awareness during the day? So the way that all three of those come together is is, is uh, very interesting. Yeah, it's definitely fascinating. And then when you think about how that's making your wheels turn and you're thinking about all this, imagine a child who does, doesn't have um, the language or understanding for any of this stuff yet. So now they're just, you know, yeah. trying to live their lives <laughs> and they're having issues with these and the way these receptors are firing in their brains and working together and, and you know, yeah. No wonder they're acting out. No wonder. Yeah, it's these like you. Uh, uh, I'm at a baseball camp with a kid that's having trouble balancing when he's throwing, and I'm just like, "Have you ever checked out your vestibular system? Are you are you sure that's all in check?" And they're just like, "What do you uh, just throw the ball to me? Why are you talking?" Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. What are you talking um, about? <laughs> but yeah, that's a good point. If if you're a kid, it's uh, that's. It's where the therapists and the the parents come into play to be able to understand these concepts and then make it exciting enough for a kid to want to to do to integrate it into their lives where where they can at least have some sort of grasp of okay this is good for me to do these exercises. Exactly. Yep. They need they mm-hmm. need they need the grown ups help. Yes. At that point, so I, right? I thought we could end off with some quick questions about sensory diets and we're coming up on 30 minutes so we could do kind of a a rapid fire q a these are some questions these are some questions just okay. for uh some background <laughs> for listeners I, I combed through a few facebook groups and, and reddit groups and these are a, a lot of questions that parents or, or people in general are posting in the group boiled down to a few of these and I'll also link the the sources in the the podcast description as well but these are there was a lot of overlap with these few questions so so I will ask you Jen and then you can inform me and the rest of the all about kids podcast world all Sounds right. good. I'll try my best to answer. Uh, That's all. Uh, you've ar- you've already <laughs> made me as a dumb person understand three of the most complicated systems of the body. So I have I have faith in you. <laughs> so the the first one from the forums is how can I tell if my child's difficulties are even related to sensory processing as opposed to something else that's going on in their body. So the quick answer to that is there's really no foolproof way to know what is causing the breakdown. And especially because behavior and sensory processing differences are really closely tied together no matter what. You know what I mean? It's what came first, the chicken or the egg? You know, is it the sensory concerns that are causing the child to act out? Is the child acting out and then trying to use sensory coping mechanisms to soothe themselves? And it just goes round and round. And at the end of the day, first off, I always want a medical professional to to see the child to rule out any underlying medical diagnosis that there may be. But after that, it almost, I I hate to say this, but it almost doesn't matter, right? You know, what matters is it's affecting their lives, right? And we need to help them. And then the more we tease through different things, then you might see what exactly is causing it. Is it a behavior or is it a sensory stimuli that they're trying to, you know, deal with? So there's really no, no way to know without a lot of digging to figure out what exactly is causing it. But um, after the medical team has gone through and figured it out, that's where the, the OT and other therapists can get down. Yeah, to, yeah, that's a good point. If there's out. no underlying threatening medical issue or, or anything like that where a doctor needs to step in and there are exercises that are improving the quality of a child's life, why not continue doing that? So number two is... Can my child be both over and under responsive to the same stimuli, a, a lot of or, or uh, same sensory input? A lot of parents were saying they'll do something with their kid one day, like play loud music, and they'll be joyous over it, and then the next day they'll they'll hate it, and it'll kind of spark anger, something like that. So, can you be over and under responsive to the same input? So there's a couple different things at play. The first thing is it's a fine line 
line of figuring out that perfect amount of the stimuli in question, right? Um, because, you know, a lot of these strategies are these, um, the input that we want to provide that the child's seeking, um, you know, it could very easily tip the other way. You know, they, they need it to calm themselves or to help regulate them. But if they get too much, now they're going to go the other side. Now they're going to be a little bit too out of control and unregulated. And if it's not enough, you're going to see no change. So it definitely is a, um, you know, a give and take. you got to try a bunch of different times and see what exactly is that perfect one. Um, and a big piece of that is in empowering the child to help them recognize, okay, this seems like enough. I think my body is good, recognizing how their body feels after input. So allowing them that time after the input and, and helping them talk, talk it through. If they're younger childs that don't have that language yet, like toddlers, um, you know, then you're going to have to keep a close eye on it and start small and build up you know, because you could always add more, but you can't take it away once it already went, you know, once you already did it. So then also maybe having some strategies, if you notice it did get too much, how can I help them get back down now? And then there is also just the thing to keep in your head, the, a child could be over responsive and under responsive to different stimuli too, all the time. Like that's something that frequently happens. Like they might be you know, sensitive to sound, but they 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 are seeking tactile input. You know what I mean? So just because your child's under responsive in something doesn't mean they're across the board going to be under responsive. So that's also something to consider because maybe you are playing loud music, and maybe the key to it is they're seeking out tactile input. So maybe while you're playing loud music, you want to have them playing with. I don't know, Play-Doh or something that they could try and regulate that way, something that they're looking for while giving something that they tend to avoid. Um, so, yes, yeah, so either it's, that it's a, or a as a parent, you need sure. to get better taste in music. So your so your kid can sit through a song. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe they're maybe they're just pissed <laughs> off at your selection. So yeah. <laughs> the next question is, will my child outgrow his or her sensory issues and is there a point where parents were wondering when they should start tweaking the, the sensory diet or the sensory exercises to be socially acceptable as an adult? Like if something persists into your teenage years to start making plans for that. Mm -hmm. So uh, the short answer is probably not. Your child's probably not going to outgrow any of these differences. And I don't mean that to be depressing by any means. The point is, you know, we want to give them the tools to be okay with those differences. So I think I mentioned this in the last episode. Think about yourself. Um, every single one of us has sensory preferences, right? You know, things that you prefer, things that you like, things that you don't like. And you probably always had those, those preferences, you know, when you were a kid and through the teenage years and now as an adult. But the difference is, as an adult, we know how to manage that. And, and we know how to manage our reactions to the stimuli that we don't prefer. And we know how to do it in an appropriate way. So we wanna have the children be able to give their bodies what they need or to deal with when they're gonna get things that it, it doesn't prefer. You know, so it's not about curing it and fixing it. It's about dealing with it in an appropriate manner. And doing it yeah, and and a lot of adults. a lot of my time at least is dedicated towards managing my sensory inputs, whether it's one way or whether it's intentional or not. It's not necessarily an intentionally structured diet, but there are periods where I think, oh, I I, I need to be moving right now to feel better, or I need to relax, or I need to listen to music, or go for a walk, or whatever it is, and so. I, I imagine you wouldn't you wouldn't want to rip that away as an adult. You'd want to just find more better ways to to integrate them. So the exactly. last question exactly. is what are the most fun sensory activities that my kid can participate in with his or her friends or, or other kids? Some some parents mentioned scavenger hunts or, or dance parties, having a big trampoline in the backyard or something like that. Is there, is there anything you've come across that has been a consistently good idea to 
or a consistently good outcome where a kid has done something in a group and, and that can also take care of his his friend time and his his sensory time simultaneously yeah so the good thing is summer is one of the best seasons for sensory play in general sensory play can be very messy sometimes, especially if you're talking about tactile input, you know, sand, water play, finger paints, all of that kind of stuff sometimes makes a lot of parents like cringe because they're like, I don't want that in my house. Oh my God, I'm going to have to clean it up. But the the great thing is in summer, yeah. you just can't <laughs> yeah, out exactly. of the house to do it. Um, you know, you can go in the backyard and you can have a big bucket of sand and who cares if it spills, or you can have a big, you know, those children those kitty sized pools you can fill with all sorts of stuff and and it's contained and it's okay if it's messy because it's outside so i love summer for for that reason so there's so many great things and what i was mentioning before there's so many places that you can go in the summer the beach the park you know there's so many outdoor concerts um using sidewalk chalk there's so many great things in the summer that are easy inexpensive or things you're probably going to do anyway or want to do anyway so you know that's that i love summer for that um as far as any things that have consistently worked there's so many to list. So really just what I touched upon earlier, just exposing your child and just playing with them and exposing them through play. So if you know your child, you find something that they do like and they respond positively to and use that to break into the ones that may be more challenging. So if your child really likes playing with his toy trucks, um, but he avoids touching different textures. Okay, well, maybe our toy trucks need to go to the car wash and we need to put, you know, shaving cream on them to wash them. And then we need to rinse them in the water and we have to use brushes and that, that, that tactile input. We need to use brushes to clean them, you know, and now, oh no, the truck is going through the dirt and it's getting all dirty. And now it's going in the paint because it needs to get painted a new color. Uh, there's so many different things. And you're using the one thing that your child is comfortable with, the truck, what they like, and we're using it to push their limits a little bit. So continued exposure and using things that they already approve of and, and uh, you know, not being scared. Like I mentioned, the, you know, parents sometimes are, are the inhibitors. We don't want to get dirty. We don't want our houses to get dirty. But when we're talking about sensory input, you know, no holds bar. Like, don't, don't be scared to get in there with your kid and show them that, you know, mommy's doing it too. Daddy's doing it too. And that's something to consider. And that could be really helpful for children as well. Hundred percent. Well, thank you, Jen, for your continued fascinating educational <laughs> insights. I I am blown away with this episode and last episode how many things with sensory diets apply to a general sense of well being in general, whether you're an adult or uh, a young kid. And so I, I'm I'm very interested in having learned about this and. If you're listening, I'm sure there are a bunch of insights you can take away too as a, a parent or another therapist. If you're a kid, you might have to wait a few years to understand what we're <laughs> talking about, but you know, go ahead and try. But yeah, thank you, Jen, for hopping on the podcast and you can subscribe wherever you're listening or watching this to keep up with these chats. Thank you. All right. See you guys. Bye.